Welcome back to Revival on the Air today, the podcast all about when God performs a miracle in somebody's life. In this episode, the miracle is a healing from cancer of the cervix. And Rosie tells David her story about how that came about, what happened, her perhaps lack of faith because of it seemed like such a big healing, and then how she received this peace that just cannot be explained uh, through any natural means. It's a miraculous story, and I think you'll really enjoy listening to this one. God bless. Welcome to the Revival on the Air Today podcast. My name's David. I'm here in Adelaide. I'm at the Adelaide Convention Centre for the 2023 Revival Fellowship Convention. And we've got so many visitors from interstate and overseas that I've just bumped into someone I haven't seen for many years. So I'd like to introduce uh, Rosie Andrews. Welcome to the podcast, Rosie. Hi. And welcome to Adelaide. Thank you. Yeah. How long since you've been in Adelaide? Oh, pre-COVID. Pre-COVID. <laughs> yes. So the last convention, I think, or maybe the one before that. Yeah. Okay. And uh, how are you enjoying the convention? Yeah, it's been good. Yeah. yeah, we've caught up with lots of people we've known over the years and, yeah, enjoyed the testimonies and talks and things, yeah. So how long have you been coming to this fellowship? Um, this came along in 1983, a long time ago, when I was much, much younger. I just started training as a nurse at that time. And one of my colleagues actually told me about a church where they had miracles. She talked about things like the Lord coming back. I'd been in a religion and never heard of those type of things. I, I was brought up in an Anglican church, went to an Anglican school. So that was all a bit different, a bit confronting, really. And I, I kept my distance, but I watched her for a while. And then finally she challenged me to come to a meeting. And I came to the meeting and decided to be baptised at that meeting. First meeting? Uh, yeah, my first meeting. But I waited a year to come to the first meeting. Okay. Yeah. So what were you thinking about when you, after being brought up in a traditional church yeah. and being told about things like healing? miracles, yeah. power. That was pretty unusual, yeah. In my experience, church, God wasn't something that you talked about in public. It was something you kept to yourself from my upbringing. Um, so when this girl t spoke so boldly about the Lord and she spoke about miracles, I thought, whoa, you know, that's that's different. That's really different. And I, I guess that's why I was scared to get involved. You know, I didn't, I was hesitant. Because it was still Christian. You were talking about God and Jesus and church and Bible, but there's something... Yeah. Yeah. You weren't sure about. Yeah, I, yeah, I was curious. I asked religious people. I, I didn't even think to use. I'd never used a Bible in my life, so I didn't think to look in my Bible. I asked religious people questions over that period of the year, but I, um, I didn't know how to use a Bible till I came to the church. I'd never opened one, so yeah, I never got any satisfactory answers from religious people. They just answered me off the top of my head. But when I came to that first meeting, the same questions were answered by the pastor at that church from the Bible. And I was quite amazed, you know, you know, that they were directly, as I asked the questions, they opened the Bible. That was quite something new to me. Yeah, so... So where, where, where was that? That was in Perth, in, in Morley in Perth. Okay. Yeah. And uh, what happened at that first meeting? So you, you got to went, hear things about the yeah, scripture? Yeah, I went to observe. I thought if I just went along, then this girl would stop talking to me about it. You know, perhaps that would get her off my back, so to speak. So I went mostly to observe and just to see. I, it was, yeah, it was, I was quite surprised. I enjoyed the singing. I, um, I heard testimonies. I didn't understand the talk. But at the end of the meeting, um, new people were encouraged. You know, well, somebody spoke to me because it was my first meeting. And, you know, obviously I had all these questions that had been rattling around in my head that hadn't been answered. And um, they, they gave me satisfactory answers. They also said to me that, you know, the Lord was coming back and that on the day of the Lord, I needed to stand before him on my own. And I, because I'm thinking, what my family going to say? They're not going to like me being in this group. But they just, um, they challenged me. They said, on the day of the Lord, you stand on your own before the Lord. And I thought, well, that's the case. I want to be back. I do want to be right with the Lord. So I got baptized that night. Had you, now we know baptism as full immersion baptism. Yeah. Did you know about full immersion baptism yeah. before? I'd been sprinkled as a ba as a, you know, an infant. Um, and Jackie, my, my, my friend, had spoken about this full immersion baptism. And I thought, well, I haven't done that. I actually had in my head, perhaps I can go and get baptised and then I'll be right with the Lord and I can go, go away again. But I would have ticked that box. I had, had very little understanding, obviously. I'm sure she spoke to me about speaking in tongues, but it did, I couldn't comprehend it at all. I couldn't get beyond the baptism thing. Okay. So you were baptised in the meeting? Yeah. Your first meeting? 
meeting? Yeah, my first meeting, I was baptised, yeah. Okay, what was that experience like? Well, yeah, I felt like I was doing the right thing because they just read, read it to me as a commandment in the Bible. So I felt like I was doing the right thing by the Lord. It was the middle of winter. I was a bit worried what people might... I was always worried about what people might think, you know, because I was coming back to the nurses' quarters where I was living with wet hair at 10 o'clock at night. You know, what, what would people think, you know? Couldn't tell them I'd been baptised. So, yeah, I was baptised and I went um, to another room to pray with the people that baptised me, and that's when I spoke in tongues. Spoke in tongues. Yeah. And again, did you... You'd obviously been spoken about that at some stage. You hadn't kind of comprehended it. You hadn't sunk in. Yeah. But here you are at, late at night. Yep speaking in tongues. I spoke in tongues. I was a bit overwhelmed. The people beside me were very excited about it. But over the next 24 hour period, I completely talked myself out of that experience. So you went back home and that was it? Yep. It didn't happen? To, yeah, pretty much. During that next day, I decided, you know, that's it. I've been baptized. Um, and I, I thought I'd just let the speaking in tongues go. But two people from the church came to speak to me that evening they had to follow me up. And, um, and they encouraged me to pray. And I just said, no, I, I'm sorry, I'd rather not. I sent them away. And they just asked me to hop down and pray on my own after they'd gone, which I did. And that's when I really realized what I had because I'd said hallelujah a couple of times and this language just flowed out of my mouth. And that's when I really understood what I had. You know, like I realized, wow, I, I, I've never been, um, at, wanted to be out of control. Like, and, and I found that I could pray loud, I could pray quiet, I could stop, I could start. You know, I was, I was frightened by the whole thing, but when I realized, I just felt so good when, I, when this language was pouring out of me. It felt fantastic. I prayed for ages and ages. Yeah. Okay, so you actually felt like you had control over your tongue. Yeah. It wasn't an out of control experience. Not at all. No. No, but something in that made you feel good. Oh, absolutely, yeah. A, a sort of good that I'd never felt before. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So how, roughly, how old were you? I was 21. Yeah, 21. Okay. Yeah. So you were a young woman studying yeah. nursing. Yeah. What happened with your life after that? I, um, I started to become really interested in what was in the Bible. Things like um, people were talking about the Lord was going to return one day. And I thought, wow, I want, you know, I maybe need to be right with the Lord, you know, follow on in this way. And uh, my family noticed a difference. They noticed a happiness in me when I went home to them. And um, yeah, I started to go to meetings. It was a little bit difficult with the shift work sometimes, but um, I went to as many meetings as I could. Uh, I think I was learnt, grew, grew quite slowly because of my inconsistent <laughs> meeting attendance but yeah I slowly started to understand I asked a lot of questions I always had my questions answered from the Bible and I started to slowly understand yeah what had happened yeah. so I'm going to jump forward now 40 years what's kept you here what's kept you coming back for 40 years um, it's that experience. I've, I've still got that same experience. Whenever I'm in trouble or whenever I need, I can speak in tongues. I've got that one-on-one -on -one experience with God. And when I pray, the Lord answers my prayers. You know, I, I, I feel comfort in my heart. And um, yeah, it's fantastic. So this is not just a feel-good experience. You said when you pray, the Lord answers your prayers. Yeah. Can you give me an example? Or two or three? Yeah, okay. So last year I was in Singapore and um, I developed a back pain. I never had any back pain all my life, but it was quite, it was really bad. It actually became worse over the, the following 48 hours to the point that I couldn't sit in the chair. I was just wriggling and writhing and really, really uncomfortable. And I asked, I was at a, a meeting in Singapore at a camp and I asked, uh, we had a prayer line, I asked for prayer and um, the chap who prayed for me, we, we didn't pray for long, but we were, I was just in instantly healed. I was, I was totally overwhelmed. I've never had a healing like it. And the, the pain completely left me, the pain in my back. I was, I couldn't believe it. It was, I think every time you have a healing, it's a little bit different, you know, it's, there's no formula as such, you know, it's the Lord, the Lord just did a miracle. It was absolute instant healing from writhing around in the chair to just being completely free of that pain. It was fantastic. So you had no idea what it was? The pain in my back? Yeah, it's just that it um, was painful. It happened. I had a, a massage. We had, we were at the camp and we had a massage and I was very tense during the massage and I'm not sure if, if something was damaged or pressed the wrong way or something, but I had pain straight away afterwards, but it just increased in severity over the 48 hours. I couldn't find any way 
to get any relief. I took some pain cab- tablets. I didn't even touch it. Um, and yeah, I didn't. I don't know what. What I didn't have it diagnosed or anything, but I, I was aware that it was becoming greater. It was becoming greater, and then you had prayer in the prayer line. And it was instantly gone. Instantly gone at that moment. Yeah, and I was totally overwhelmed. I'm not that type of person normally, but I was overwhelmed, and so was the chap who prayed for me. And we both had a fantastic experience. Something really happened. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and you've had other miracles, I know. Yeah. So another healing that I had was I'd been married for about 18 months and I had a routine test that ladies have called a pap smear and um, didn't think anything of it. The results came back from my pap smear to say that they'd found, they'd found a problem and could I you know, make an appointment to see a specialist. It was just before Christmas time and it was difficult to get an appointment. They suggested that I needed quite an urgent appointment. And I thought, oh, that's a bit inconvenient you know perhaps I should just put it off you know to the new year and they said no we'd like it to be you know you just see somebody within two weeks and I thought hmm I thought maybe they're not telling me the whole truth here you know sometimes that might have been playing it down anyway we did make an appointment to see a specialist it was a gynecologist and my husband came with me to the appointment and we had the letter saying that um, I had numerous atypical cells. That's what they'd found on my pap smear. So not normal cells, so possibly cancerous cells is what they were suggesting. And the suggestion from the GP was that they needed to begin some form of treatment as soon as possible. So we kept a copy of that letter. I still have a copy of that letter. Anyway, I went to see the specialist with my husband. He performed all sorts of examinations that day. I was, I was absolutely terrified. Well, actually, I need to backtrack because I saw the specialist within two weeks. But during that two weeks leading up to that time, I was really distraught. <laughs> I mentioned that I worked as a nurse and I, either my last walk or my second last ward, I'd worked on the cancer ward, oncology, and I'd nursed people with the same condition. I knew that it was an aggressive cancer of the cervix, quite an aggressive cancer, and I was really frightened. Hence the reason why they ask women to do regular checks. It's an early identification. Yeah. Let's, we know it's aggressive, yeah. so we have to attack it early and yeah. get this treated. So yeah. you knew all of that, knew all of that. and I, and I imagine it, it would have been terrifying. Absolutely terrified. I, I was struggling to sleep. I was struggling to eat. I was just totally distracted. It was occupying all my thoughts night and day. My husband was also pretty distressed. You know, we'd only been married a year and I couldn't understand. I, I saw it as a big, big healing. I thought, oh, I don't know if I've got enough faith for this. That, that's in my, you know, my natural mind. That's what I was thinking. So yeah, we were going along like this. We were praying, my husband and I. We didn't tell anybody about it. And then one day we actually went for some fellowship and somebody noticed we were distressed and they said what the problem was and we told this one person what the problem was and his response was yeah it's a healing but there's no big healings or little healings with the Lord like I'm I'm measuring it as to be a, a, a big healing and he said you know by his stripes you were healed it doesn't matter you, you know and, and so then you know with that thought in my mind we both got down and prayed again and I think it was a couple of days later it was all within this two-week period we were driving on the road and I just received a total confidence that I've been healed. I can show you the point on the road, you know, where, where I was. And I just turned to my husband and said, I know I've been healed. And from going from a, a, a state of mind where I was just, just distraught and distracted, I just received this confidence and this, I guess, a kind of peace that the problem had been taken away. So maybe that was 10 days into the two week period. And then, you know, maybe four days until I saw the specialist, something like that. I went to see the specialist with a calm in my heart. It it was totally different. And um, yeah, so we did see the specialist on this day. He did, you know, all sorts of examinations and, you know, he was questioning, why have you come? And he said, I can't find anything. But he said, I'll need to do a biopsy. You'll need to wait for the results of the biopsy, which he did. And yeah, the biopsy came back completely clear. He couldn't find any problem and he questioned why I'd been referred to him. So, you know, I think at that point in the time when I received the confidence, the Lord had dealt with the problem and completely taken it away. But you have a letter, you have a referral letter. Still got it at home. Yeah. That says... says I have nu- numerous atypical cells. And that's the thing that they're looking for in... Yeah. Perhaps means. Yeah. So what happened after that? You, you've been kicked out of the specialist office yep. saying, we don't know why you're here. Yeah. 
So he, he said, well, we can't just, you know, he was confused. He, he was thinking it was a mistake that I'd been referred almost, you know, that was what he was inferring. Um, he said, you know, we're going to have to do rigorous follow-up, you know, just to make sure. So then I was put on, you know, I think it was three monthly and then six monthly, like over time it became increasing increments for my follow-up. And um, there was no further problems, you know. And, you know, over the years I've had no, nothing, you no know, abnormal pap smears at all. I went on and I had two children, you know, a number of years down the track, two healthy children, no further problem at all, completely, completely and totally healed. Yeah. In terms of your miracle and your testimony, how many people do you think have heard this testimony? Ooh, lots of people. Lots yeah. of people. Yeah. 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 What, is, what does it mean for you to be able to have this thing that you can say, not only do I have a relationship with God, not only can I talk to God when I need to, yeah. but God actually does things for me. Yeah, it's pretty big, actually, that he should care about me uh, to, to, to take away a problem in my life. You know, I nurse people with this problem who had no hope, you know, who had no answers. And um, I had the problem and I, I had a way out. You know, I had, it was, my pathway was different. And, um, yeah, I, I feel special that the Lord should care about me and should, yeah, take care of my problems, you know. It's, it's, um, it's pretty wonderful. Yeah. All right, so you came to know the Lord in 1983. You've been married. A year later, you've had this phenomenal healing. Yeah. You've gone on to have two children. Yeah, they're adults now. They are adults now. Yeah. And you've been coming along to the fellowship for yeah. 40 years. Yeah. Sydney. Uh, Perth? Perth initially, and then we had eight years in England and seven years in Sydney, and then we returned to Perth, and we've been in Perth since 2003. So, yeah. Are you much of an evangelist? Um, in a quiet way. Quiet? Not, yeah. Quiet yeah. way. One on one, yeah. I'm happy, you know, my, um, I witnessed to my neighbour over the fence, you know, and if people are talking about the problems in their life, you know, I, I feel like I have an answer. Yeah. For example, my, my neighbour um, was expecting a baby and she'd received really bad news from the doctor that she, the pregnancy wasn't a, about you know, likely to last. And I said, we can pray about that. And I said, that's what we believe. We believe the Lord can intervene. And she was quite surprised. But they, I said, I can't, I, that's what we do in our church. And I've had the experience myself. So I, pr I prefer the one-on-one -on -one personal chat to people type with, rather than, a, you know, street outreaching or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And do you share this testimony yeah. with people? Yeah, I do. Yeah. What's the reaction that people get when you say, I've had this cervical cancer or potential cervical cancer yeah. that just disappeared in two weeks. It's interesting. People are different. A lot of people just don't even let it sink in. You know, it's too big. It's too too much to believe. Even, even my own family, they prefer not to talk about it. So they just, I don't think they can comprehend it. Maybe, it, I'm not sure, I'm not sure why people react like they do. Some people in the fellowship are, are encouraged by it, you know, and um, people have asked me to write down my testimony to hand to other people for witnessing, which I'm, I'm happy to do. But yeah, um, I don't know, yes. Yeah. Mix, it's mixed, yeah, mixed reaction. Mm. Okay, so there's, you've had some, you've had a big testimony. Yeah. You've had a on the spot testimony, yeah. healing. Yeah. You've had a lot of comfort and peace in your life. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think is the most important thing for maintaining your walk in, with the Lord and maintaining your relationship with the Lord? Uh, I really think it's morning prayer. Morning prayer? Morning prayer for me is, is the key. If I get up in the morning and make prayer my priority, I have a good day. If, if something goes wrong, I miss the alarm or something, and I try and go off to work without prayer, and my day will be rubbish. But morning prayer, um, you know, because, you know, when you've been in the Lord a long time, there's no guarantees, and you still have a lot of trials. Um, even last year, I had a really bad year. I struggled. I just struggled with meetings, and there was a few, a lot of issues going on in the background with family and, you know, children, etc. But um, I, was, I was just struggling with fellowship, you know, just actually being around people. And I, I missed meetings and, and that sort of thing, but I didn't miss my morning prayer. I just, and I was, I was probably just hanging on by the skin of my teeth. And um, it was actually when I went to the Singapore camp, 
I promised a friend before COVID that when our children had finished school, we'd go to Singapore camp together, and we did. And we went to Singapore camp, and, and I hadn't been valuing, I have to be honest, hadn't been valuing the fellowship so much. You know, I'd been missing some meetings, and I went to the Singapore camp, and the Singapore Saints during COVID couldn't fellowship together. They were just on Zoom. So this camp was the first camp they'd had in three years, and they were all just so enthusiastic to be there. And that was that was very confronting for me, you know, like they, they're happy to be here. I should be happy. And um, yeah, a few things happened at that camp. At the airport, I lost my um, credit card in the ATM. So I had it, the machine kept it, you know. So I had no money, <laughs> no cash and no card. So I'm in a foreign country with no cash and no card. We went to the camp and I had a massage and I ended up with this back problem which became increasingly worse over the next 24 hours. And then my glasses broke. My, and I'm blind, you know, I need my glasses. So all these things were quite humbling. You know, I was away from my husband as well because I went with a sister. You know, so that all these things were kind of trialing me and I, I became you know, a bit overwhelmed. And it's, then at the same time, I'm witnessing these, these uh, sisters, the fellowship, you know, just really people really enjoying the fellowship. And then I prayed for this healing at, you know, three days into the camp or something, was completely healed, completely moved. And I started to look back over the previous thing and previous months and think, I hadn't been valuing the fellowship. You know, this is really special what I've got. And I think, you know, I had been praying every morning and I think that's what kept me going. But I think over time, perhaps you don't value the fellowship. You know, I'd, other things had got in the way, you know, different sort of worries in the natural and I hadn't been valuing it. And then I remember sharing my testimony at the Christmas camp last year, just how I felt like I was close to falling from, from you know, walking with the Lord and how the Lord had, you know, hung on to me, you know, and all these different circumstances happened in a foreign country over a period of three days or something and culminated in this miraculous healing, which, you know, I was I was healed and I yeah, I just realized that, yeah, the Lord cares and, you know. The Lord still to, cares. The Lord is still there. Despite me drifting away, he was still there for me. And it was a real refocusing time. And the thing was, I shared that testimony at the Christmas camp. Um, I got up to share my testimony and um, a lot of people, you know, benefit, you know, came to me and said that really helped them as well. You know, that people realize it is easy to slip. It was very easy to slip away in the Lord. I realize you know, now. Even though you're still getting up and praying in the morning, yeah. and you're, you're still going to meetings. But if you don't value going to the meetings and, you know, the things that we do, if you stop doing those things, you can just slip away and, yeah, that would be tragic, wouldn't it? But yeah. <laughs> yeah. And interestingly, in that time when things weren't going that well, yeah and you was kind of drifting backwards, there was that anchor still. I think it's because the prayers become a habit. And um, I, a brother in our fellowship gave a talk about good habits and bad habits in the Lord. And I think it's because my prayers become a habit, it's just something I do, that I kept that habit going. And I really think that's what kept me, you know, plus, you know, maybe some brethren that were looking out for me as well, which is a good thing to have. Before we finish, I'm going to ask you, I'd hate you to leave Adelaide and think, oh, I should have said that thing to David because it was really important. Yeah. I'm going to give you that opportunity. Is there anything, any final words or other thing that you think, actually, this is a good time I'm going to say this. I believe that the Lord gives us these testimonies not to keep them to ourselves, but to share them. And, you know, getting up on the stage is quite confronting sometimes, but, you know, it's it's my, the testimony that the Lord gave me, but it's to share with other people so that they can see what the Lord can do. Everything the Lord's done for me I was bullied at work the whole team was bullied at work 10 people but my pathway through that trial was completely different to the other 10 people and I really understand that um, through the things I've gone through that I'm the head and not the tail the Lord's got a different pathway I'll go through everything that everybody else in the world might go through you know we, they have they have things that go wrong out there you know they get th like the people in the cancer ward but my pathway is different you know the Lord leads me and I think when I pray in the morning I just know that if I pray that's why I like it in the morning especially, not that I don't pray in the evening too, but morning prayers are must um, because I know the Lord will take me through that day and then we'll get through and we'll get to the next day and the Lord will take me through and that's just what works for me. Well, the good news is that your prayer is just about to be shared with a lot of people. Your testimony is about to be shared with a lot of people because we have this podcast so that people can hear 
other people's experiences and the power and the miracles that the Lord is doing for them. So thank you for joining us on the Revival on the Air podcast and I hope you enjoy the rest of the convention. Thank you, Rosie, for sharing your stories about your life, your life with God, your life with your brothers and sisters and what God's done for you. It truly was a wonderful story to listen to. If you'd like to be part of a fellowship where the brothers and sisters love each other and care for each other, if you would like God to heal you, if you would like him to change and transform your life, then we have the answers in the Bible for you. And we'd love to talk to you about that. So please reach out. You can email us at podcast at revivalontheairtoday.com or contact us through social media. Just search for Revival on the Air Today. Until next time, God bless.